Good day. This little presentation concerns the underpinnings of psychometric theory, also known as classical test theory. Uh, this is not a how-to guide. There are no calculations involved, uh, though the concepts are to some degree inherently mathematical. You, again, there's no need to actually crunch any numbers here. And we're gonna really do this at a basic level, going right back to the origins of the theory and it's, you know, it's the most fundamental concepts that underlie it. So that being said, I do have some things to show you. And here we go. Right, so um, what we now call classical test theory uh, dates back to the very early 1900s and the work of uh, the late great Charles Spearman. Uh, it's a statistically based theory. It is you know, grounded in, in mathematics, uh, ultimately in the general linear model, so-called. Uh, Spearman introduced the basic concepts, the most basic equations. Uh, the theory, of course, was not completely you know, fully developed at that time. Uh, over the next half century or more, you know, more refinements were added and, and things continued to be, uh, one hopes, improved. Uh, this is still probably the most widely used approach to the development and the evaluation of psychological and educational tests. Uh, I should, however, mention you know, that there is an alternative approach nowadays uh, known as item response theory. Uh, it's quite important. We're not going to be going into it here. Okay, so here's where it begins. Uh, Spearman has you know, one of these sort of flashes of intuition that can, can form the beginning, you know, the, the genesis, as it were, of a whole extensive career of, of thinking and probing further into its implications. And as with many of these insights, it in retrospect seems very simple and rather obvious. Uh, whenever you take a measurement of any kind, whether it's your professor you know, giving you a test to see how much you've learned this month, or whether it's you measuring the height of your child to see how much they've grown in the last year, every measurement you take involves both truth and error. Some of what you're getting is what's really there. Some of what you're getting, you're wrong. It's a, it's a mixture, a composite. And that's vitally important because you know, when we are in the process of you know doing science, for example, uh, you know we are always taking measurements. The trouble is that the measurements cannot be perfect. Uh, here's how you can represent this. I said no math. I promise we don't have to calculate anything. Uh, the observed score, which is x equals, right, a combination of T for truth and E for error. There it is. Now, error. Error comes in two flavors. Uh, one type of error is what is technically referred to as systematic error or bias. Uh, this is a kind of error that is consistent. It's always the same. It always goes the same way. You know, your bathroom scale happens to be calibrated such that it adds five pounds to everybody's weight. Granted, that increases the likelihood you're going to throw it out the window, but let's assume that for a while you don't catch on to this. So everybody seems to weigh five pounds more than they do. You know, uh, you could have quite possibly, uh, say, an intelligence test that systematically underestimated everybody's IQ by 10 points. Uh, this is obviously a very real practical problem. If people are supposed to be getting their weight to a certain level or children are supposed to be of a certain degree of intelligence or what have you, uh, bias is a big deal, especially if it applies to some people and not others. But it isn't actually a statistical problem. It's a practical problem. Uh, if you add 10 points to everybody's score, it, the scores will still correlate with everything else to the same degree. It won't affect things. So in conceptual work about tests, we don't need to worry directly about systematic error. Again, we will in practice. We'll touch on that at some point, but not today. The other kind of error is 
random error. See, the trouble with randomness, of course, is that you can't predict it. You don't know where it's going to go by definition. So whereas with systematic error, I can apply a simple correction, you know, subtract five pounds, add 10 IQ points or whatever. I really can't do anything systematic about random error. I can't correct for it. So it's the real conceptually problematic form of error. Now, a little thought experiment, you know, what happens as we keep taking measurements again and again? And, you know, again, you can just think of something as simple as measuring your child's height against the door, you know, the side of the door using a measuring tape. There are all kinds of possible sources of error there, aren't there? Uh, you know, you're measuring tape or yardstick, if you're trying to use a yardstick, you know, could be uh, not properly calibrated or you're letting it hang and it's wobbly or the kid's wearing heavy socks or shoes or their hair has gotten longer or you're looking at them from a different angle because they've grown, you know, all kinds of things can creep in here. Um, now, nonetheless, the very first time you try to measure something, all you can say is my best guess, what my best estimate really, is that what I got. Uh, my child is, you know, four feet, five and a quarter inches tall. This student has an IQ of 108. Now, there probably is error built into this. I mean, there definitely is error built into this. The problem is how much, and we don't know yet. So now we make a second attempt. You know, we, we go to measure the same thing again. You know, we get the kid to keep standing there and we say, now hold still, you know, measure the tension. And it's like, oh, you know, they are, hmm, that came out half an inch taller than last time. You know, we run through another, you know, the IQ test again with the kid and, oh, their IQ is 104. Hmm. Well, you know, something random got in the way. But now we can make a better estimate of what the true score would be. Could average them out, right? You know, so, okay, the, I don't remember the heights on the child, but, you know, the IQ should be 106 is my best guess. By the way, Spearman had a great way of demonstrating this that you can't do anymore. You'd, you'd be arrested. Uh, he actually would set up a, like a cheap rifle or shotgun or something uh, in, in like a vice pointing down a hallway and have students come up and, you know, pull the trigger one by one and they'd see where the bullets hit. And, you know, there's random error built into the flight of a bullet, right? The, you know, the, the rifling can be imperfect. There could be grit accumulating in the barrel. The bullets aren't perfectly shaped. There's not the same amount of gunpowder. There's stray breezes blowing. Some kid yanks the trigger really hard and moves it, you know, all kinds of stuff can happen. Uh, so, you know, the, each successive bullet isn't hitting the target in exactly the same place. But on average, as you take more shots, literally in Spearman's case, figuratively in most real life cases, the random errors are going to start to cancel themselves out. That's because, remember, they're random. There's no more reason to expect me to overestimate your height than there is for me to underestimate it. And so we keep making, taking measurements and we keep making errors, but the errors will average out to zero. So there's some midpoint, the, the, the average of all of our attempts at measuring our child's height, not that we would bother, but you know, the average of all of our attempts at measuring this child's intelligence level or IQ, not quite the same thing. Uh, that's our best estimate. Now, what we can do along the way is to see how the errors are distributed. Most of the time, most of them are going to be pretty close to the same central value, like the errors won't be very large. Uh, a few will be farther out, and this will tend to conform to what we call the normal or Gaussian distribution. You know, I'm, you, if you see me in the corner there, I'm making the little bell-shaped curve with my hands over and over. So we can establish what the distribution of errors is. Uh, what this means is that 
while we can't directly know the truth, we can estimate error. I'll circle back to that. Uh, here you see two, uh, two ways of trying to illustrate this. So in the chart on the left, you see a, a form of something approximating the normal curve. It's a bit more peaky, but we'll call it the normal curve. So we take a whole bunch of measurements and there's an average or mean measurement we obtain. Uh, the measurements we actually get are distributed around that value with more of them falling close and fewer of them further away. So that's my best estimate. Now, if there's bias built into whatever I'm using, then there's going to be a systematic error such that everything is going to come out off by a given amount. Whereas if there's no systematic error, then all I have to worry about is the so-called random error. Uh, the chart on the right does it the way Spearman did it, right? This is, you know, bullets apparently hitting a target. Uh, if you have a large degree of systematic error or bias, then the midpoint of your measurements is going to be very far from the target point. Now, again, that's not necessarily a statistical problem, although it's obviously a problem if you're hoping to hit the target. Uh, on the other hand, what we can call statistical error, which is the same, another term for random error, uh, if that's large, then we have shots all over the place. Whereas if it's small, we have them all clustered very tightly together. You see, there's very little random error built in here where I'm pointing, but though there is a large bias, a large systematic error. Uh, on the far right, of course, we see the ideal case in which there is little to no bias, little to no systematic error, but also little to no random or statistical error. So we're actually clustering around the bullseye. So again, the implication here is that although we never have a direct way of accessing truth, we can learn or estimate based on experience the degree to which random errors are creeping into our measures. We also know what we got. We know the result we obtained. Knowing the, the obtained result and knowing the error allows us to estimate truth. You remember the equation was x equals t plus e. If I know x and I know e, I can solve for t. That's the idea conceptually. Uh, the true value is whatever you got, plus or minus the random error. And of course, there's the rub. We don't know which way the random error went this time around. So it's plus or minus. We can, however, estimate where the truth is and how far off we might happen to be. What we want, of course, are, is to reduce that error term. We want the most accurate measures possible. Which means to start with, we need to know at least how much error is built in, is baked in to the measurement tools that we're actually using. Uh, and this leads to the second sort of big insight in psychometric theory. There are really three altogether. The first is this, for this fundamental idea, x equals t plus e. The second one is the concept of reliability. Now, we're going to have a lot more to say about reliability in future presentations. Uh, for now, we'll do a quick def set of definitions and just look very briefly at the four major types of reliability and then move on. When you see in various textbooks in psychology, education, and other fields, uh, definitions of reliability, the term that comes up most often is consistency. You know, how consistent are the measurements? You, know, you, you stand your kid up against the door six times and how similar are the height measurements you get on those six occasions? And by the way, this is the same day, not waiting six months when they grow. Uh, arguably a, a, a better term and one you're more likely to see in perhaps you know, physics or engineering textbooks, which don't usually speak of reliability directly at all, is precision. You know, uh, how narrow is the band within which we would say the truth must lie? You know, remember, picture that target again. If they're all clustered together in one little area, it's a more precise 
well, in that case, precise shotgun, I suppose, but a more precise measurement. But if you wanted a really pure and good definition, it's what proportion of what you're getting is the truth. So, you know, you go back to that x equals t plus e equation, which again is not for numbers. Uh, if you took truth and divided it by truth plus error, which is to say everything, how much of what you get, what proportion of what you're getting is the truth? And in theory, that could range from zero, right? You, you, know, you have a measure that's absolutely random and worthless up to one where you know, there's no error. Uh, neither of those is at all likely. Error-free measurement is in fact impossible, but that's the idea. Uh, and in fact, as we'll see, there are many ways of calculating this, which we're not going into in this presentation though. Uh, to get a more reliable measure, you really got two and only two ways of doing it. Uh, one of these is quite simply to take more measurements. You wanna know where you know, Spearman's gun is aiming, keep pulling the trigger and eventually you're gonna find that you know, the bullet holes are all clustering around one spot there. Uh, you wanna know how much the child has learned, you know, give them not just one quiz, but you know, 10 quizzes on the subject. And if they don't run away screaming, you know, you'll have a better measurement. Uh, you also could of course, simply make the test longer if it's a classroom test or an IQ test or something, because uh, most tests are made up of multiple items and really each item is one shot. Each item is one attempt at measuring what you're after. Uh, the other approach and the only other possibility is to improve the individual measurements that you're taking. You know, the experiment got a better gun, you know, or cleaned it better or had, you know, actual brand name ammunition and not, you know, um, recycled stuff, you know, from some guy in Georgia who, you know, recycles ammunition, uh, then it would be taking more accurate shots. Uh, or of course, if we're writing tests, personality tests, intelligence tests, whatever, write better test items. Uh, sometimes that's easier said than done, of course, but that's, these are the only two things you can possibly do. So just to try to capture reliability, because uh, that's been very abstract, let's try a little thought experiment. You have to imagine a person taking a test of whatever sort it might be. Again, it could be a classroom test. It could be that they're responding to ink blots. I don't care. They're being measured in some way. Now, imagine that you've got like, you know, the hall of mirrors or a prism of some sort, and they are being prismatically refracted across the multiverse, so-called, right, into an infinite number of parallel universes. It's the same person. They're taking the same test under the same basic conditions. Well, how closely clustered will the results be? How similar will the scores be? Because all that's left now is random error, you see. We're not changing the person or the test or the conditions in any planned way. That's what reliability is. That's what it's all about. Now, the problem, of course, is that we can't actually, you know, hold up some kind of magic prism and refract somebody into even, a, you know, a thousand, let alone an infinite number of parallel universes. So we have to have ways of estimating this. And there are, uh, there are several, which we'll get to in just a moment. Uh, when we do so, we derive something known as a reliability coefficient. It's a statistic uh, very much like a correlation coefficient that you should have studied in your basic statistics class. Uh, and the, the reliability coefficient actually captures that concept. How much is the truth versus how much is present at all? So you're looking at what uh, in another form, another kind of jargon would be referred to as a signal noise ratio. You know, noise is the random error. There's a signal and there's noise. How much of what I'm hearing through the headphones is the signal and how much is static. Uh, this allows us in turn to calculate something called a standard error of measurement. Notice we're not doing any of these calculations today. Uh, the standard error of measurement is based on a reliability coefficient and it's a way of estimating the extent to which 
error is likely to be present in a measurement that I've taken. It is basically, not basically, it is the standard deviation of the random errors. Um, and this in turn can be used to construct what we call a confidence interval, which is a range of scores within which the true score probably falls and probably means set to whatever degree of probability you choose, 80%, 95% as here, or whatever you think is appropriate. Uh, now, again, we're not doing any of that work in this presentation. We'll do that in a series of other presentations, kind of breaking this down into bite-sized chunks. Uh, just a reminder, you know, that's what the old normal curve or Gaussian distribution looks like. Uh, you know, again, most values are somewhere near the midpoint. Uh, in fact, about 68%, little over two thirds, fall within one standard deviation of that mean. About 95% fall within two, about 99 point something percent fall within three. And after that, they start to get vanishingly rare. Reliability, uh, there are four forms of reliability. I mentioned before, there are types because we're only estimating reliability. Again, we don't have the ability to come up with a perfect reliability statistic. Uh, and we're not going to delve into them right now. Uh, one is called test retest. It's exactly what it sounds like. Test them, test them again, see how well the scores correlate. Uh, second is called parallel forms. Uh, also sometimes called equivalent forms or alternate form reliability. Uh, this is the most specialized one. Uh, here you're trying to have different forms of what you're considering to be equivalent tests. Uh, the third is termed internal consistency, and it's kind of a look inside a test that's made up of many items to see the extent to which they're you know, all doing the same thing. Uh, and the fourth is variously known as inter-rater, inter-judge, or inter-scorer. Uh, this one is this one applies when you have uh, a scoring system that does require some degree of judgment or expertise. Again, not going into these any further today, uh, because we're going to move on to the next big idea. I do want to emphasize that any one of these is only an approximation, and any one of them applies only to a subset of the possible tests that are out there. Now, why does there have to be one more big idea? Isn't precision enough? <sighs> well, here's the problem. Yeah, high reliability is an essential component of any good measurement tool, but it doesn't guarantee that it's a good measurement tool because it's entirely possible to have a test that has really excellent reliability. It's highly precise, but it's completely bogus. It's completely worthless. Uh, think back to the 19th century phrenologists. They could measure the various dimensions of your skull very accurately with their, you know, the, those weird devices they would put over your head. Uh, or consider, you know, the ancient pseudoscience of astrology. Uh, you know, maybe once upon a time you could have called it a science because they hadn't yet given up on the possibility of predicting anything definitively. But, you know, look, an astrologer knowing the time and date and place of your birth can graph out the positions of the sun, moon, and planets very accurately. But neither one of them can actually say anything about your personality that turns out to have, have hold any water, right? So these are examples of you know, perhaps highly reliable measurements that simply don't do what we want them to do. So that means we need one more big concept and that's validity. Validity is the thing we're really after. All right, so validity. The simplest way of defining validity is pretty much what I just said. It's what we're really after. Uh, to, what, to what extent does this test measure what it's supposed to? That's kind of it. You know, and it, again, you could have one that's set to zero, like a phrenologist's description of you know, how honest you are, uh, or you could theoretically have one set to 1.0. It's perfect, though again, that's not realistically possible. Uh, that's it. Now, you know, how is that different than reliability? See, reliability was only about to what extent is it measuring something? You know, phrenologists are measuring something, astrologers are measuring something, but 
they're not measuring what they think they are. Now here's, there is a little complication here. So I hope you're getting that, that distinction though. Reliability, to what extent are we precisely measuring whatever it is that we're actually measuring? Validity, to what extent are we precisely measuring what we think we're measuring, what we claim to be measuring? And those are different things. Uh, now, there is a little complication with this definition. Uh, many of the tests that we use are used for many different purposes. So I might have, for example, a personality test such as the MMPI being used sometimes to assist in psychiatric diagnosis, uh, sometimes to assist in treatment planning of you know, what form of, of psychotherapy is most likely to be helpful, sometimes to estimate how uh, fit you are as a parent during a bitterly contentious divorce, sometimes to estimate you know, how likely it is that you will be a um, proper police officer. And you see, each of those is a different usage of the test. And the, the fact that we know, say, how valid it is for one of those purposes doesn't speak to how valid it is to any of those other purposes. So, you know, if we know, oh, look, here's how great it is at doing psychiatric diagnosis, that doesn't inherently tell you that it's equally good at telling you how fit a parent someone's gonna be. Uh, so you really need to establish validity for each possible use of the test. And there isn't therefore like one coefficient you can point to and say, ah, oh, the validity of the MMPI is 0.6. You know, that could be for one thing, but not for another. So, you know, why worry about reliability at all? Because it is essential in order to get where we really want to go, which is the validity. In other words, logically speaking, reliability is a necessary but not sufficient precondition for validity. Uh, it's clouding up as I speak. Cloud cover, we might say, is a necessary precondition for heavy rain. But it's not a sufficient condition for heavy rain. That is to say, you know, it won't rain if there's not a cloud in the sky, at least not much. But there can be quite a few clouds in the sky, and that's no guarantee that it will or won't rain. This is how reliability works, you see. It's, it's not sufficient to say, ah, it's going to be valid. Um, if you wanted to put this in more you know, sort of mathematical sounding terms rather than you know, in terms of philosophical logic, what we would say is that reliability sets an upper bound or upper limit on validity. A test can't be more valid than it is reliable. So what we can say then is, if our test is very low in reliability, it can't be very valid. You know, the rubber ruler, so to speak, is not measuring anything very well. Uh, a test high in reliability may or may not also be highly valid. Okay, validity also comes in different types or flavors. Uh, and there are three main forms. Again, we're not going to delve into them in depth today. This is for a future presentation, uh, but they're known as content validity, criterion validity, and construct validity. Uh, content referring to uh, sort of conceptually the, you know, our judgment of what's in the test and whether it seems up to an expert's eye appropriate to what we're trying to measure. Criterion validity referring to the extent to which the test score or other measurement can actually uh, tell us something about something else, something besides the test. Uh, I gave the example of uh, you know, using an MMPI to predict whether someone would be a, an appropriate police officer, for example, uh, that would be a case of what's called predictive validity, a subset of criterion validity. We give the MMPI to a bunch of people joining the force and then kind of check in a couple of years later and see how they're doing uh, to establish the predictive validity of the MMPI at you know, for this purpose. Uh, concurrent is another form of criterion validity, simply referring to things happening at the same time. Uh, if I were using, say, the MMPI again, to uh, try to diagnose people, I, I could use as a criterion the diagnosis reached by a 
panel of expert clinicians who spent several hours, you know, interviewing the patient. You know, well, to what extent does the test all by itself do what, you know, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, mental health counselor, and a clinical social worker all conferring together, each meeting the patient for a couple of hours would conclude. Construct validity refers to the extent to which it really taps into some underlying abstract theoretical concept or construct. Now, again, this isn't the day where we're going to go into these in depth, but we will be. So wrapping up and getting ready to move on, uh, classical test theory has been around for over a century, uh, thanks to Gold Spearman, and it remains to this day one of the standard approaches to evaluating all sorts of measurement tools, such as psychological and educational tests. There are three big concepts here. First, of course, the central insight that truth and error are compounded in every measurement we take, and that it is along with this that it is possible to estimate the error term. Reliability refers to the result of doing that kind of estimation, the degree of consistency or precision a test has, that is the degree to which it is relatively free from random error, Validity refers to the extent to which it actually does do what we hope it to do, that it successfully performs a task for us uh, or taps into some important theoretical concept. And we can estimate both reliability and validity using empirical data, you know, scores of tests we've administered and other data we collect by plugging in the basic psychometric equations which along with validity and reliability as concepts are what we're going to be covering in future presentations. So uh, for today then, that will be all and we will wrap up, bye.